A lot of people today are asking, what in the world is going on? What in the world is going on? Some of you have perhaps heard about the search on Google of late through YouTube as well about the September dating uh, for the rapture of the church. Well, I would just suggest to you that there's more to that than what is being put forth on the internet and there's a context that is being missed. That's not to say that it couldn't happen then, for we do have reason to believe that the rapture of the church would be right around uh, the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, uh, because the Bible shows us time and time again the Lord Jesus knocked down one feast after another with pinpoint accuracy and in a prophetic way in answer uh, to that which God had in His sovereignty set before us so that we might not be in the dark uh, when those things occurred. We're going to embark upon a little journey through the book of Revelation. We have not done that for some time. And so I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Revelation. And I am well aware that there are many views out there, most of them hostile to a literal uh, interpretation of the book of Revelation. I cannot see that as anything but sinister in its moorings, but for my part, I see a panorama of what God would have us to know about the last days. It is interesting to note that with all of the different viewpoints out there, very little in many sectors of Christendom is being said about what is really going on. I have a subtitle to the message. If you've looked in your bulletin, you've already seen the title, The Apocalypse, and uh, we use that word advisedly. Verse 1 says, the revelation, the Greek word is apocalypto, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this book is that. It's revealing Jesus for who he is. But I do have a subtitle that I would suggest you scribble down somewhere and ponder. And it would be this. A weak book. <laughs> okay? A weak book. Not W-E-A-K but W-E-E-K, a weak book. Because we have a lost week in the 70 weeks of, pro of years prophecy that Daniel set forth in the book of Daniel in chapter 9, verses 24 and to the end of that chapter. That week was really left hanging after the Lord Jesus presented himself in uh, the triumphal entry and what we find is that in that passage in Daniel, a lot happens between the 69th week and the 70th week. And we'll get into that a little bit later uh, when it's more pertinent. But beginning in chapter 4, we're going to see Israel as the central focus of everything that goes on in this book. Chapters 1 through 3 bring before us Jesus his bride, or his church, and then there is an absenting of the church from chapter 4 to the end of the book until you get into chapter 20 when the bride actually appears coming down from heaven in the New Jerusalem. We're going to look forward to that. <clears throat> I'd like to remind myself much of what's being said in the Scriptures prophetically because when I do that, it makes me homesick. It makes me homesick. And I remember a guy who was living in South Carolina, and he walked by this car, and this car had a bumper sticker on it, and it said, I miss Chicago. I miss Chicago. So the guy smashed his window, stole his radio, punctured his tire, slapped a bumper sticker on it, vote Obama, and then he wrote a note saying, uh, I hope this helps you feel a little better. <laughs> because that's what Chicago's all about, okay? So... I want you to know there's a lot of things in the scriptures that just thrill the heart. Perhaps nothing thrills the heart more than knowing that God knows the end from the beginning. Uh, than knowing that if we read the last chapters, we in fact do win. That God is in fact to be found, found to be faithful. 
and that you and I have a lot of exciting things in store for us. Perhaps one of the tragedies in many Christian lives is that they have been denied and, in fact, robbed of their blessed hope. You see, we look for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, <laughs> Jesus Christ. We do. And if you look for that, it thrills the heart. And so when you're looking at Revelation, you're looking, you're looking at a book that tells us what is about to happen. When you look at the book of Revelation, you see it is laid for, set forth in a very orderly fashion. It's not haphazard. It's not knit together. It's not slipshod. It is not without purpose that God gives us this. In fact, this book is a book that is an open book, as it were, uh, in contrast to the book of Daniel, who at the end of his writings in chapter 12 was told to take his book and seal it up because it was not yet for a little while before that would be something people would really understand. We go through the book of, of Daniel, and from our vantage point, we see the rise and fall of, of the, uh, the, the, Syri uh, the Medes and the Persians and the, and the Greeks and the Romans. And, 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 and now here we are at the cusp of the end, and we're seeing the rise of the, the landmass, which is known as uh, the United States of Europe, and that, that whole landmass coming together, and a one-world government, which really was the spirit and heart of the Roman Empire in its day. It was the world empire, and it is now on that same landmass, back at its spot, even as the book of Revelation postulated that there would be an Israel that would have to be dealt with during the tribulation, they're back. They've been back since 1948. They were gone from 70 AD to 1948. Awesome things. I wish we had ours. Because I could be like a fire hose and just just thrill my heart by telling you <laughs> what, how cool this stuff is. But we're going to focus. So if you would, look at verse 1. The Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Let's pray. Father, we stand dwarfed in the presence of such lofty words, and we're only eight verses in. We are grateful for the power of your word, for what it does in our hearts, for what it does in our dispositions. Father, I pray that as we draw near, as we lean in, as we try to take with us that which you would have for us, that we would be stirred. To realize that on the continuum of time, we have a place that is unlike any place that any part of the church has had before. We are running the ball to the goal line. We are going to be the terminal generation, it would seem, from all things that we are witnessing today. 
May we represent you well. May our hearts be stirred and strengthened as we embark upon this study. And most of all, may the Lord Jesus Christ be lifted up and glorified, for we ask it in his name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. I read those verses to you because there's nothing like reading the Word of God publicly. And we took the first section of chapter 1 as a unit because the, they hang together. A lot of things are brought before us as we look at these words. Uh, verse 1, for instance, says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. If we just dive into the word revelation, we understand that there is something there for us. The word for revelation is the word apocalypto, and the word is made up of a compound of the word klepto and the word cryptic, or crypto. Now, you know when something's cryptic, it means it's mysterious. You just can't quite understand it, and you know the word klepto is, uh, has to do with stealing something, all right? It's like the psychiatrist's office had that sign in there, all kleptomaniac patients pay in advance, you know, they're just making sure... They're going to get theirs, all right? So uh, uh, the, the cryptic and the stolen is now being apo, which is the preposition we have in the word. And that means it's not any longer cryptic. It's not any longer stolen. It's now laid forth on the table. It's set there so you can appreciate it, so you can dive into it, so you can drink it in and visit it and revisit it. In fact, this particular book is said to have a blessing to it. Verse 3 says, Blessed is he that readeth, so I'm already blessed. I remember about a week ago when I began to just let it play over and over again, chapter 1 in my mind, and reading it out loud and reading it over and over again, I was getting goosebumps. I was getting excited. A blessing was attached to it. But not only is there a blessing attached to reading it, but there's a blessing attached to hearing it in verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear. And it is also a blessing attached to those that keep those things that are written therein. Understand that is said because so many are not keeping it. That is a tragedy I cannot, uh, I cannot emphasize enough. Why? Well, because when you lose your hope, you don't really purify yourself. The Bible says he who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. The reason the church today is not all that pure is many times because they've lost their hope. You know how it is. You're going to get a visitor, right? Maybe a family from out of state's coming in, like at the Crowley residence. There was, they were coming. You should have seen that place last week. I just want to say, it was a wreck. No, I don't know that. I didn't see it. But we all are like that. Man, you do cleaning and fixing and tweaking and arranging when people are coming. If you knew Jesus could come back at any moment, if you really, really believed that, it would impact you, wouldn't it? And I'm telling you, that's exactly how we live. We are to live in that light because He could come back at any moment. He even says in this passage that the time is at hand at the end of verse uh, 3. Why? Well, because He had already put everything in motion. The King had uh, revealed Himself to His people and He had been cut off and He had ascended. He had poured out the Holy Spirit. The church was born. And now it's just a matter of its growth and unfortunately its apogee and demise. We are witnessing the end of this church age. We know that because of many things that are set before us in chapters 2 and 3. We won't get ahead of ourselves. But we see there's a blessing attached to those that keep this word. I'm reminded of a family who had a little girl who came home from school, and she went in and asked her mom, Mom, where did all this come from? Uh, how did we get here? And she sat down at the kitchen table, gave her full eye contact, and just breathed into her heart the unsearchable riches about God's creation. She said, well, you see, God in the beginning created Adam and Eve. And then they had children, and their children had children, and thus here we are. But we were creatures of God. And she went away satisfied and went back to her playing. Subsequently, she was thinking about it further, and she thought, you know, she just wanted to try this question out on her dad. Dad, 
how did we get here? And where did we come from? And what's it all about? And he proceeded to tell her, well, we came from a monkey. We came from primates. We used to be in primordial soup. There was little legs drawn up on certain creatures. They leapt up out of the soup, came on the trees, jumped out of the trees, lost their tails, began to wear clothes and move on down the road. Well, you can imagine the little girl was pretty perplexed. And so she went back to her mom. She said, Mom, Dad said we came from a monkey. And you said we came from God. And she looked at her and said, well, she said, that's your dad's family line, and this is my family line. All right? So there's a lot of disagreement on that, but there's also disagreement on the book of Revelation. And I want you to know that that disagreement is not something that is necessary. The devil is afoot, and he's trying to mess things up for the God's people so that they will be lethar lethargic. And so as we read this, understand there's a blessing attached to those who keep the things written in this book. The word keep is the same word for keeping the commandments in 1 John, and it means to keep your eyes on them. Tereo, it means to guard these things. You know, somebody tries to take away your hope, you slap them back with, Thus saith the Lord, let every man be a liar, let God be true and every man a liar. You take your hope with you everywhere you go. You cannot trust the devices of men. Men are compromised many times, and thus they are crippled because they can't preach what's in the Word of God because somebody might be offended. And they might say, uh, like that little girl, you know, one said this and another said that, and they're perplexed. No, perplexity is the devil's job. That's what he's about. He is, in fact, the author of confusion. He is, in fact, the father of lies. Don't let anyone take your hope. Now, when we look at verse 1 again, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Uh, and what the word must means is it means it's bound to. It's decreed. It's an absolute certainty. The word shortly, we get the word tachometer from. Tachos. It means speedily. It doesn't mean it's going to come to pass exactly after Jesus gives this word to John. It just means when it starts, it's going to be breakneck in speed. It's going to happen so quickly, uh, it's going to knock you back uh, in your chair, as it were. It's going to happen quickly. Now, I, I, I've said it before, people in our day are not concerned about their souls. It seems like a pervasive reality. And I'm not just talking about lost people, though certainly there is a startling uh, uh, lack of sensitivity to their eternal destinies. But even in the church, many times people aren't thinking about how they want to present themselves to their king. He could come at any time. When it happens, bam, you're out of here, and we're going to be raptured. Uh, you say, well, the, book, the Bible never says the word rapture anywhere. Oh, but it does. It uses the word in the Latin translations, raptoro, which means to be snatched away. The Greek word is harpazo, but there's a rapture in the Bible. The Bible talks about us, we who are alive and, uh, and remaining under the coming of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 4, shall be caught up in the heavens with Christ, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, uh, that the dead in Christ shall, be rise, uh, shall rise first, and this mortal shall put on immortality, and this, immor uh, this corruptible shall put on corruption, and death shall be swallowed up of life. We are told uh, Lot in symbology was snatched out of Sodom before the reign of God, the wrath of God poured down. We see Noah being put in a boat, and he being taken in an ark, and he being protected while the rest of the world was subjected to his, God's wrath. We see in picture right out of the gate with Enoch, who walked with God and was not. Because God took him. You know what I want to be? I want to be a was not. <laughs> oh, beloved, we have a lot to look forward to. I want to be a was not. And I'm looking forward to it. And I'm keeping my eye on this book. The Bible says uh, that in verse 2 that it was John who wrote, the angel gave this word unto John, and it says, this is John who bare record of the word of God. Remember the book of John? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, and he really drill, drilled into the words, Word of God. Jesus is the embodiment. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was the one who revealed Jesus as the Word. 
And so in the first, per, first place, he says he's the one who gave us uh, the record of the Word of God. And then it says, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And when you see him talking about that testimony of Jesus Christ, you see him talking about uh, the, the things that he says in verse uh, 2 further. He says, and of all the things which he saw. And so when you see him talking about this, this continuum for John, he says, I was the one who wrote to you earlier. I wrote to you about the fact that Jesus was the Word of God, and then I wrote to you about the things which we have seen, which we have handled, the things which we've looked upon in verse 1 of chapter 1 of 1 John. He says, I've written you epistles, I've written you a gospel, now I'm, written you, I'm writing you a prophecy. He says, I'm bringing you these truths. So I'm somebody who can, uh, really, be, uh, can, can really draw down on and believe, because I'm going to tell you more of what I've already whet your appetite to understand. And then he says in verse 4, now we're jumping past what we've looked at because we don't want to overwhelm you. Verse 4 says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace unto you and peace uh, from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now this passage right here, this verse, has baffled some and there have been some who've tried to uh, navigate it uh, in maybe different ways. There are many things that you can say about it, but one thing you have to remember when you come to the book of Revelation uh, is that we must have a good understanding of the entire first 65 books before we're going to have a very, uh, any kind of capability to understand this 66th book of the Bible. When you understand the first 65, it gives you a little bit of an underpinning to understand what is before us in this 66th book. For instance, in verse 1 where it says, He sent and signified it by his, angels, uh, by his angel to John, we see the word signified. Right away we understand something, that there's going to be a lot of signs in this book. And what we have to understand is when we see signs mentioned, we've got to go look and see where signs or the signification of things is used elsewhere in Scripture to understand what that means. Jesus said, if I be, he says, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem and be lifted up, right? And the Bible says, and thus he spoke, signifying, same word, uh, by which death he would die, which he would be hung upon a cross, he would be lifted up. If I be lifted up, the idea of signification or signification, he says, I said this, lift it up, when you see it, you'll understand it. For us, we're going to see some signs and symbols, but not everything is a sign, and not everything is a symbol. Some people like to make the whole book an allegory, and thus walk away saying it couldn't be understood anywhere, anyway. But the Bible uses symbols all through the Old Testament. So we know how those work. Jesus spoke in parables. And he says the kingdom of God is like unto something. So we know when he uses signs and symbols, it is always to lead us into truth. It is actually to conceal truth from those who are scoffers. And it is to reveal truth for those who are seekers. So isn't that good to know? He doesn't want to hide from us what's going to happen. He wants to reveal it to us because it's an apocalypse. It's a revelation. It's an unveiling. And what we see in these verses as we come to verse uh, 4, uh, it says that this is John writing, and it, he's writing from him which is, which was, and which is to come. Now, if you're just reading the book of Revelation, you're thinking, I think I know who that is. But if you've read the rest of the Bible, you know over and again, certain of these words were used in other passages of Scripture. If you were to look in Isaiah 53, the Bible says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. You see, that whole chapter in Isaiah 53 says there's something that needs to be revealed. It's the right hand of God. If we were to put a title over verses 1 to 8, we could say what we're seeing here is Jesus is asserting his deity. He culminates in verse 8 by saying, I am the Almighty. So right out of the gate, he says, I'd want you to know in my revelation, let's just clear this up. You've had questions. Yes, Thomas got it when he saw Jesus in his resurrection uh, in his resurrection body, he falls on his face, uh, on his knees before the Lord, and says, my Lord and my God. He got it. He didn't rebuke him for saying that. 
Peter preached it in Acts chapter 2 when he says, You see this poured out? It's poured out by Him who was dead, rose from the dead, ascended, and is seated in the right hand of God. And He's now pouring out this power. He sent forth the Holy Spirit. Nobody could send forth the Holy Spirit but God. And what you understand is that He is saying, I am the Almighty. When he says he is he that is and was and is to come, he's connecting himself to things that were spoken over and again in the Old Testament. And he will use other words like that, other verbiage like that. The Bible says in verse 5, or I want to stay with verse 4, the Bible says further in verse 4, it says that this is from him which is and was and is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now understand, this seven spirits has troubled people because what do we got here? We've, we're trying to figure out, this, is this the Holy Spirit? And it is understood to be the Holy Spirit of God. But you say, why does it say seven uh, spirits? Well, the connection, again, you have to go to the Old Testament to find it. So I'm going to ask you to quickly look back at Isaiah. Go back to Isaiah in chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11 is a place where we get a glimpse behind the curtain in one sense. It speaks to us in verses 1 to 5 about uh, the spirit that would be upon Jesus when he was on earth. Okay, The spirit that would be upon him. The Bible says there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, right away, we see Jesse, we know that's David, and we're looking for a king, right? This has been a very dry branch. This has been a very uprooted tree. Seems like it's been cut down at the, at the very base of its, uh, of its uh, tree root there, right, to the ground. Looks like there's no hope for it. And so it says there's going to come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. It's going to be something amazing because Isaiah is prophesying the demise of, of Israel. But at the same time, he says there is hope. And he says, he says there's going to be a stem uh, of Jesse, and he's going to be a branch. And if your Bible is as mine, it is a capital B, because we know this is talking about the coming of Jesus. Why? Well, read on further. Jesus sa It says of Jesus that the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, and this is said six times, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There are six, and yet the book of Revelation says seven. Well, I was just pondering this recently. There was, this was where most scholars would go and say, there we see the spirit that was on Jesus shown from different vantage points, six in number, but there is a seventh in the passage. The Bible goes on to say, he shall make, verse 3, he shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Uh, he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither shall he, uh, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the, and, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now we know that's going to happen at the Revelation when he comes and breaks through the sky in Revelation 19. But it's also going to happen at the terminal hour of the millennium when the nations come against Jerusalem one last time and he wipes them out. So he's going to smite. So we're looking now at him not just being a root or a branch. We're looking at him full-blown coming to the end of his career where he smites the nations. Okay. So this little synopsis then ends with these words, verse 5 and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Do you see a seventh spirit? The spirit of faithfulness. Why? Because many times people look at Jesus as if, yeah, that was a great story. It maybe had a little, uh, you know, a little little lift for a season, but look, we've got iPads, and we've got electronics, and we've got TV, and we can see things in the stars, and boy, you know, ATs, and we got movies and CGI, and so we think he's not faithful. What's the first thing he's called when he breaks the sky? His name shall be called Faithful and True. Chapter 1 again of the book of Revelation 
The Bible says of him that he is faithful, verse 5. It says, and Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. If you look at chapter 19, you'd see it say, faithful and true. He would be called, and that's the spirit, the, that girding of all the other spirits. It's one spirit, but it's a, what we might call the fullness, the full expression. He, he didn't judge harshly in his first coming, but he will smite in the end. And all things will be revealed. That's the best I can give you right now. But that chapter alone gives us a little bit of an idea of how we use this book. We look for it in the Old Testament. Sixfold, note seven, and we begin to see there is a seven uh, spirits before the Lord, uh, before the Lord's throne. Verse five says it's from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the Prototokos, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, this is a tipping of the hand for you and me of chapters 4 and 5. Right out of the gate, there's this wish that Jesus would have glory and dominion and honor. And that is what happens in chapter 4. Chapter 4 will bring before us the throne room of Almighty God. We will see all the nations, all in heaven, all the heavenly hosts going in and saying, To you be glory, because you created all things. Chapter 5 will be in the throne room, and they will be the peoples that are gathered from every nation and tribe and tongue. And they will say, Glory and honor and, 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 and power be unto you. Because you have redeemed us. So, redemption and creation. Everybody comes together with one voice. Consensus. Be unto Jesus. Glory be unto Jesus. That's what's happening. And right out of the gate, they're saying glory and honor be unto Him. Why? Because He is deserving of it. And today, they take His name as a swear word. And they defile it. And the Bible says, mine enemies take my name in vain. I will not hold him guiltless who takes my name in vain. And I've heard Christians take his name vainly. Not in the full-blown sense maybe that we hear sometimes. But that is the most beautiful name of every name that's ever been named. The name of Jesus. And to him be glory and honor forever and dominion forever and ever. And he just has to say an amen right there. Because this is where it's going. It's all about him getting the honor and glory due his name. He didn't get it the first time. He got a cross. But the second time, he'll come with a crown. And we'll take our crowns and we'll throw them at his feet. He didn't get a throne. He got a thorn. Now he's going to get a throne. He's going to rule and reign. And on it goes. Things that are un left undone will be now brought to their culmination. Verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds. This is how he came to Ezekiel when he was seated upon the canopy of that, that chariot of God. And Ezekiel sees this whirlwind across the desert. It comes up to him as he's by this, this, this river in, 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 in Babylon. And he's, he sees as he's catapulted by the Holy Spirit above this canopy. And he looks down and he sees one like unto the Son of Man. And the depiction is unmistakable. Jesus rode upon that throne. And he was coming, he came to Ezekiel. On the, on the clouds. When Jesus ascended on Acts, in Acts chapter 1, remember, the Bible says, while they beheld Him, He ascended, and a cloud caught Him out of their sight. You remember that? That's talking about His canopy came to get Him. <laughs> okay, because that's what He does. And the Bible says He's coming uh, with the clouds. And the Bible says, and every eye shall see Him. How could that be before there was television and cell phones and tablets Every eye will see him. You know, we're seeing Texas right now, right? Every eye sees Texas somewhere on the line. We're seeing the mess. And we're gonna, they're going to see him. Not we. We're not going to be here. I'll get to that later. <laughs> okay, but hang on to that. But every eye will see him. And look at this. And it says, And also, they also which pierced him. Direct connection to Zechariah talking about the Israelites being redeemed. It says they will look upon him whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him as for an only son. 
They will ask Him of the wounds in His hands and His feet. This is centuries before Jesus died. Where did you get these wounds? I got these wounds in the house of my friends. That's where I got them. They're going to see Him whom they pierce. They're going to mourn for Him and be converted. And that's why this book is a weak book. It's the weak that is left unfinished. Seventy years, seventy weeks of years are determined for your people, uh, Daniel. And it's going to be broken up in 483 years and one, or 483 years and one seven year period. And this is that amplified for our, uh, for our instruction. The Bible says, uh, every eye shall see him. And it says, and all the kindreds of the earth, in verse 7, shall wail because of him. Why? Because when he comes, all the nations of the earth including those who are converted when He does break the skies at the end of the tribulation, will wail because of Him, because they were left behind, lost, and had to go through the trauma of the, of the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the, and the bowl judgments. And they're going to say, what have we done? Uh, I was hearing a word on, this, on uh, the radio this past week, a man who... Uh, evidently was a drinker who actually uh, was very, very much more bold to drink, uh, to drive when he drank, because he thought he could do anything, because it made him think he was very uh, much more uh, capable in his stupor than he was in his clarity. And it ended up that he ended up running over a 12-year-old child, because he was drinking and driving, drunk. But the real tragedy was is that he ran over his own child. You see, this is what the world is going to feel like. They're going to wail because of him. And even those who have been born again and sealed their faith by enduring to the end, uh, their, their experience with the Holy Spirit is going to be a little bit more like what it was in the Old Testament, we believe, because there's this sealing that takes place for the church, but there's this uh, thing that David said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. As if he could come and go. He came upon King Saul, but then when Saul was disobedient, he came and went, and he sent an evil spirit, and it was a mess. And you and I, we have the blessing of having been sealed by the Holy Spirit. There's something going to be uh, disorienting about the trauma of the tribulation that all the nations are going to mourn and wail because of Him. But the Bible says after that, that they may wail because of Him, He says with no uncertainty, He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. When you go back in the book of Isaiah again, somebody has called that the fifth gospel <laughs> because there's so much about Jesus in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus saith the Lord King of Israel and His Israel's Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. So who is this Jesus? I am the first and the last, the Almighty. He's the Redeemer of Israel. I am the first and the last. And besides me, listen, there is no God. That's 44.6. 48.12 says, Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my, O Israel my, and Israel my called. I am He. I am the first. I also am the last. We see Him talking about it again in chapter 5 of Revelation in verse 6. And I, John says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits uh, of God sent forth unto, uh, into the earth. He's sitting where? It says, in the midst of the throne. That's where he is. He's a lamb in the midst of the throne. He's God. And so as we see this, chapter uh, 41 of Isaiah, verse 4, talks about him being the beginning and the end again. And I just will just leave it at that. He is the Almighty God. Now, who is this? If you have no other verse that I've given you, write this one by this verse, Isaiah 9, 6. The Bible says, unto us a child is born. That's Christmas. Unto us a son is given. That's Calvary. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. That's him being crowned. 
And the Bible says, His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, the Almighty God. That's who He is. When they were told in the Nativity that His name would be called Emmanuel, nobody ever called Him that as a uh, name. They called Him that as a memorial of who He was. Emmanuel means God with us. Jesus is God. He says, in no uncertain terms, I am the Almighty. The second half of the chapter deals with him basically demonstrating his sovereignty. The Bible says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Now, the Bible says through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom of God. John knew that. The early church knew that. The church in the Smyrnian age with 200 years of persecutions and 10 decrees to kill Christians. By the way, did you hear that down in Venezuela that the, the guy who's the ruler down there gave a, a green light to anybody who wanted to kill somebody on the streets who would not get in line with his mandates as the runner of the country? They were allowed to kill them. Keep that in the back of your mind when we get to chapter 6 where the Bible talks about there's going to be war and murder and all kinds of anarchy going on. That's what's going on in Venezuela. The nations are in distress today. And we see the persecution of Christians across the world unlike any time the world has ever known. More intense than even in the days of the early church. But we don't hear that in CNN and Fox and all these places. You have to read it for yourself. It's out there. Persecution is at a fever pitch against God's people today. And God sees it all. But he doesn't shy away from using the word tribulation in verse 9 because we will, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom. Paul told the people in, I think it was Ephesus, that. And we have that very uh, deliberate uh, announcement by Paul, by Paul in the book of Acts. It says... Uh, but I'm your companion. So he's writing to seven churches, and he says, I, I can identify with you. You see, this is uh, late in the first century, so a lot of this persecution has come up. I mean, Paul's been beheaded. Peter's been crucified upside down. Most of the apostles, uh, all of the apostles really at this point, are probably all gone. And he's writing, and, and so he knows wherever he speaks. He had, they tried to kill him, he wouldn't die. <laughs> you know, you ain't going to die until Jesus is ready for you to die. Which is kind of cool, because when God's ready for you to die, he's going to be there. Amen? <laughs> Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Even the two witnesses could not be killed until their testimony was what? Finished. And you and I need to have a testimony. But he says, I'm your companion, so I can identify with your fears, your trepidations, and because of your fears and your trepidations, you need to know what I'm about to tell you. It is what will get you through. In our day, we find people who are trying to make us afraid. We have a term for it. It's called terrorism, right? If you can make people feel afraid. Most of you know your lives have changed over the past 20 years. You're locking your doors now. Some of you got, got locked and loaded, man. You got, you got guns. You know, it, it's, it's crazy. People are, you know, we're looking for an apocalypse. We're looking for one. The movies and the TV try to inoculate us to it by giving us apocalypse after apocalypse after apocalypse so that when it comes, we're going to say, oh, I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. I've been watching this on TV for years. There's a sense of that. People began to hoard. People began to stock up. People began to look for the world to fall apart. And it just very well might. Did you hear what our president said about the Texas de de devastation? He said, it's going to be very, very expensive. We don't have any money. And that huge devastation takes more money out of an empty coffer. And all the other nations are struggling already financially. And then we get hit right there as things are going up in our stock market. Suddenly there's another hit at the bottom of the Jenga uh, tower. You see, it's going to happen, and I just think it's going to happen pretty soon. Because <laughs> there's a lot of stuff happening to make it seem so. He says, I was in the Isle of Patmos, verse 9, and it was for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. If you've got persecutions because of that, bless you. He says, I'm in with you, man. We're fellow blood brothers in this. Verse 10, and I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day. And he says, and I heard a voice, uh, I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. 
What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, what I suggested to you a moment ago was he, he, he asserted his deity up to verse 8, but now what he's doing is he's demonstrating his sovereignty. Because the, these particular churches are all named by the sovereign design of God throughout ages past in a circuit that people would naturally travel in the order that is set before here, before us. These seven churches become our 70 weeks of years for the church, where the Israelites got a declaration of what they could expect as Israelites. Daniel freaking out. Man, he's reading the books of the prophets, and the prophet Jeremiah said, you're only going to be there 70 years. Daniel says, I don't see it, but he said it, so I'm praying on it. He said, Lord, we're not ready to go back. 70 years is up. And so God sent an angel and he told him what he, would, uh, he could expect for the people of Israel and it involved 490 years of history, of which seven have yet to be fulfilled. The 483rd year, Jesus was presenting himself on Palm Sunday as the king and they rejected him. A few days later, Messiah was cut off. According to Daniel's prophecy, he would be cut off after that. And then there would be desolations and Israel would be destroyed. The city would be desolate. And all of that happened in 70 AD, some 30-some years later. And subsequently, it's been quiet until 1948. So all of that stuff happened, but that one week hasn't been fulfilled yet. And this is our 70 weeks prophecy. And we're going to see it in chapters 2 and 3. So I won't drill into it too much, but if you want to find out what is our uh, expectation for the church age, it's to be found in chapters 2 and 3. And the sovereignty of God is demonstrated in the fact that not only does He write to these churches, but these churches by name become emblematic of the different stages the church has gone through in its history. Verse 12 says, And I turned to see... Uh, the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the candlesticks was one like unto the Son of Man. Now the picture you have here, he begins to say he's clothed in a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle, and it says his hair was his head and hairs uh, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on it goes. But the thing you ne need to recognize, he's with a garment down to his uh, down to his feet, and he's he's got this this girdle, and he's got this this this. It's really a breastplate. It's around his paps, which would be around his chest. What he's doing is he's taking a position in the midst of candlesticks, seven of which, uh, seven candlesticks, and he is the priest in the midst of them. So that's his sovereignty. So in each one of the churches that is represented, as we see at the last verse, that the church, that candlesticks are the churches, in each one he's sovereign. So he's sovereign at the beginning of the church age, and he's sovereign at the end of the church age, and he's acting as the high priest would act in dealing with those, those implements. But let's drill into some of this. It talks about him having being one like unto the Son of Man. If you're a child of God, you know that was one of his favorite uh, designations in the book of Luke. It also was used often for uh, Ezekiel, Son of Man. Do you see what these people do? I'll show you greater abominations than these. Son of Man, what do you, can these ones live? Son of Man. But Jesus embraced that as well when he showed himself as the perfect man. So he's like unto the Son of Man because he became... He came to us in the likeness of sinful flesh. Chuck Missler likes to, pre, uh, likes to press this reality that one of the most profound things that has ever struck his psyche was that God, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, localized himself in human form. He's called the Prototokos, the firstborn of every creation. He has preeminence in all things. We saw it in Colossians' study. But here's the thing. He's still localized. <laughs> he's still localized. When we see him, he's going to be looking like a lamb. He's going to be, he's going to be seen as, as one slain but standing. He's still localized. When he comes as a mighty angel, puts one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea to take back what is rightfully his in his dominion, he is seen 
localized. Jesus is localized, okay? When Isaiah saw him, when Abraham saw him, when Abraham saw him walking by with two angels, he was localized before the foundations of the earth because God knew what he was going to do before he ever started. He's localized his glory. We see it pulled back one moment on the earth when he's on the Mount of Transfiguration and he's shown like the sun. Awesome God, huh? <laughs> he's pretty cool. I tell you what, he makes John fall down on his face. I don't know what you and I are going to do. <laughs> if he falls down, we're just going to fall apart, okay? I don't know. Because this is Jesus. And he's being unveiled to us. And he is the Son of Man. And he's walking in the midst of these candlesticks. Verse uh, 14 says, His head and his hairs were like uh, wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me quickly to Ma uh, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. The Bible says in chapter 7 of Daniel, verse 9, it says, And I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and hair of his head was like the pure wool, and his throne was like a fiery flame and wheels and his wheels as burning fire. I'm not going to read much more of that, but I wanted you to see the designation for the same descriptors in, in, in that narrative. Thrones were set. That's talking about when Jesus comes and he takes down Babylon political, Babylon spiritual, and he sets up thrones and lets you and me, as well as tribulational saints that have been martyred, it would seem, have dominion and judgment, and judgment be committed unto us, and we will be given a kingdom forever. But the Ancient of Days also did sit. And he's got the hair of wool and so forth. Now, this hair of wool has been prostituted by some who like to say, well, this says he's, a, he's a, of Af African-American uh, descent. I, mean, I know, right? They say it's because he's got hair like wool, but wool doesn't speak of that. There's a whole segment of people that our missionary uh, runs into periodically. He says they come in and they say, see, Jesus, he was of African descent because of the hair like wool. But that wool is what sheep give us. He was a lamb. <laughs> okay, he came as the lamb. It's also white, and that's emphasized twice. And the whiteness shows his purity. Each one of these designations shows something about him. He's got this garment of the priestly uh, oversight that he would roll, have as his role. He has the connection with the Ancient of Days, which, of course, is over all things. His feet, like burning, bra like fine brass in verse 15, as if they'd been burned in a fir furnace, reminds us he was the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. He offered himself. He gave his life freely. He bore our sins in his body on the tree, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Now, we don't know what the candlesticks and the stars are until he tells us in a minute. But what they are is they're the ministers of the seven churches. And he's going to say to each one of those churches, uh, to write unto each one of those churches, and he's going to write to the messenger. He's going to call them angels. So they're called stars. They're going to be called angels. But basically what they are is they're the pastors. He says, write to them and tell them, this is what you need to know about your church and how you can make corrections or give consolation in the midst of what they may be facing. He says this, had in his right hand, verse 16, seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. If there's any question, go to chapter 19. That's where a sharp two-edged sword came out of the mouth of Jesus, to with which he would smite the nations. And his countenance was like the sun that shineth in its strength, as we saw in the Mount of tri Tribulation. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. So, if we have any questions about who was talking over in verse 8, we now see who he is. He's the one who, was, uh, who gave himself for us. He's the one who was like burning brass, and he's the one who's like unto the Son of Man. He says, I am the first and the last. He brings his deity before us. Jesus is God. Amen. He's not just a good guy. He's God of very gods. And He is all. The Bible says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He that hath seen me, Jesus says in John 14, hath seen the Father because I and the Father are one. Aren't you excited about this? <laughs> it's good to hear, isn't it? I haven't seen anybody nodding now. Every now and then I get a nod. 
I don't mean nod like that. I mean nod like that. You're not doing that today. <laughs> because this is the stuff that thrills the heart because when Jesus comes, you and I are coming with Him. And that's good to know. What manner of men ought we therefore to be in all godliness and holiness, right? The Bible says, I am he that liveth, verse 18, and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches, the pastors. The seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches. There is, again, 70 weeks of years, or 77s. That's 490 years. There's also seven churches. Those seven churches represent the continuum that you and I are in right now. We are at the end of the continuum, what we call the Laodicean age. Laodicea comes from a compound word, laos, which means laity, it means people. And dacia has the idea of rule or conquer. What the last stage of the church age will be is when the people conquer the preachers. And the preachers compromise because they don't want to lose the people. And now we're doing everything like the world does it. And therefore we are walking right along the edges of the shore and many suffer shipwreck because they're so close to the world that they can't distinguish what's holy and what's not holy. And he talks to them in the continuum of chapter 2 and 3. And here's what I want to press upon our hearts. Verse 19 should be a star by that. It is the, what we would call the outline of the entire book. He says, I want you to write the things which you have seen. That's chapter 1. You've seen my deity and you've seen my sovereignty. He says, write the things which you have seen. Write that down, John. Write what you saw. Write my garments. Write my visage. Write what you saw. God gave me what you saw, what you heard, what you felt, how you fell down as a dead man, how you were lifted up, put on your feet, and told to write. Write that, John. That's what you've seen, what you saw. I turned and I saw. And he says, write the things which are. That's talking about the church. Write about the church. Because I've got these golden lampstands and I've got these stars. And we're going to talk about them for two chapters. I'm going to tell you what happens in the first love church. They lost their first love. Come back. You know, get fired up about the truth. But be fired up about love. Because love is the principal thing. He's going to talk about Smyrna, which is the church that's under persecution. And they were crushed for 200 years. He's going to write about the church that's married. Pergamos. Gamos. Polygamy. Polygamy. Bigamy. All those things. Uh, monogamy. Gamos means married. It's when the church married the state in the early 300s. And we see that continued for some time. Thyatiro, continual sacrifice. Each one of them, the church was brought into Romanism and it was dominated and the hope was lost. They didn't keep their eyes on the hope. They thought they had the kingdom on earth. And it comes right down to the end. you got Philadelphia, brotherly love. Think of the Great Awakenings. Think of the uh, times of those, those people coming into America and the Great Awakenings and over in England, the Great Awakenings. And he says, this is what the church is going to write. The things which are, the church is now. And he says, and the things which shall be hereafter. Meta tota. And he picks it up in chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, uh, he says, and I was caught up into the heaven. I heard a voice saying unto me, come up hither. And he went up and he says, and he says, I'll show you the things which shall be hereafter. Meta tota, meta tota, meta tota. Write the things which shall be hereafter. After the church. Israel's back on stage. Beloved, we have a map. We're not in the darkness. Jesus is on his way. I like to believe old Gabriel's puckering his lips as we speak. And if he is, and the trumpet did sound, are you sure you're going? Because the most important thing to know about Jesus in this passage is that he washed us in his blood. That's what he did. He's the one who washes us in his blood and makes us kings and priests or a kingdom of priests unto our God. But if you have not been born again, you need to be. Because the Bible says in Hebrews that he who will come shall come and he will not tarry. And he says, behold, I come quickly here. It's going to happen suddenly. And when it happens, woe be unto those who are left behind. Would you bow with me for a moment?